Okay, I actually have a couple of questions directly on the last presentation. Um, one of them is about the security. Um, what I'm wondering is, how do you stop fake issuers from arising in a completely open system? So what's to stop me to create a MIT phishing site with MITx.edu and pretending I'm issuing MIT certificates? Um, the second part, he was talking a lot about the learning analytics and the data you can get out of this. And one of the things which I don't completely get is, does this give you a capacity to actually analyze what's in the content layer of different institutions? Because I imagine if you had a common metadata standard for that content layer that could record things such as ECTS or learning outcomes or so on, and you could aggregate that data, that would be immensely powerful. And then what happens with permissions in that area? Sorry for the big block of questions. The three-part question. Um, what do you mean by permissions? Could you tell me? Um, uh, uh, well, simply enough, on permissions, if you can put any amount of metadata on the, on the content, you might want to have some of that content private. So I'm not sure if I would want all my personal data that's in that content layer accessible to everybody, but some of it I might, and how does that work? Great. So um, for the question of fake issuers, what keeps someone from pretending to be MIT creating an MIT-looking diploma and issuing it to people, the way diploma mills do now. Um, these certificates are signed by both, uh, are, are actually signed by the issuing institution with their public key. Uh, that actually encrypts the hash of each certificate. If um, you're a fake institution, you, you could make fake-looking MIT diplomas. You can't stop that. But, but you would be using a public key that is not recognized as MIT. So um, using, and there's, there are already directories for this, like Keybase, and I suspect there'll be many more and much more convenient in the future. Um, but the community would very quickly identify um, these as fake certificates by the public key that's encoded in the certificate. Um, as for the, con the, uh, the data in the uh, content layer, I'm blanking out on the essence of that part of the question. Well, essentially, as I understand it, what's on the blockchain, which is totally public for sure, is the, essentially the receipt. Right. And uh, so you can put pretty much whatever you want in the content layer. Yes. Any metadata you like. And I'm wondering if you've thought about saying, listen, it would be interesting oh, yes. to create metadata standards here, aggregate that data, and so on right. from Absolutely. the content layer. Yeah, there, there is no limit. I mean, a, a document that's issued, a certificate that's issued could be in fact, a major document full of variables, full of metadata, and it all gets compressed down into a single, a single hash. So, uh, and that is related to the third part of your question is, um, okay, we have all this metadata um, not, that's been encoded into the certificates that kids are using in the world. Um, can we set permissions around that? And the answer, of course, is yes. That's not part of the open standard. At now we're talking about commercial implementations of the standard. Um, and in that way, every employer is going to, uh, I mean, every vendor will do it differently. But certainly permissions are a standard part of any pro uh, SaaS product. Um, so I can't say monolithically uh, exactly how that happens, but certainly it would be wise for every vendor to, to have permissions around the different layers of analytics, yeah. Good question. Others, please. Thanks. I hope you all, thanks for really interesting talks. I think we also get questions for the other speakers, but again to Chris actually. Um, two questions also came to mind. One is, are you sure that we can handle the, the verification of the institution? Because I have the same thought as Anthony. In a way, you have to have a central register or several central registers of the institutions that are trusted because no one will be able to tell is it now uh, I mean sort of the question is not in the end will the experts the community of educators be able to check is this MIT or is it MIT X or MIT space or whatever it might be that that shows up but rather it's the end user in many cases which really like a I know, small medium enterprise with very little technical know-how mm -hmm. will they be able to identify is this the right public key because I mean there's 
I don't know the exact number, but someone will correct me. It's somewhere between 40 and 80,000 universities in the world, and they keep changing, they keep changing names, they keep growing, they keep uh, mm -hmm. new ones keep cropping up. And depending, depending on the definition, you of course have many more institutions. So somehow you have to have a mechanism to identify which one is a real one. You know, what, what stops these many fraudulent universities that, that just you know, degree mills? What stops them from, try, from re working their way into one of these spaces? Because there's yeah. eBay's and there's two dozen others. How do you prevent that there's just one of the bases that's too open and they don't check properly and suddenly you have two dozen institutions in there which just are not real? Um, and maybe another other question would be, can you revoke certificates? Mm -hmm. So to the, to the first question, you know, the real answer now is, is it possible to determine that something's fake, not is it easy today? And to your point, you've highlighted a challenge, a real challenge, which why, is why I expect a whole range of adjacent services and vendors to spring up that make um, these tasks more convenient. But the, because it's so new, the important thing to highlight now is not that it's challenging, um, but that it, in fact, is mathematically possible um, to, to determine whether an issuer is legitimate or not. Hmm. Um, and so uh, we expect that to get more convenient over time. Um, I was say, yeah, you could, you could be the right, could certainly better than the current system, which is just a paper. Which right, holds right, exactly. Um, and to your second question, can, issue, um, can certificates be revoked? Yes, they can both expire and they can be revoked. So in the case of a professional certification that may expire after a year or so, um, it, it can be programmed to, 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 to not work or to actually provide a status of expired. Um, and the, rev the revocation, um, it, so these certificates certainly can't be edited, right? You, if you, and, and there's a lot of reasons you might need to revoke a certificate in the case of a, a mistake or you discover fraud later. Um, but every time you issue a certificate, there's actually a, an output, um, uh, a, little, a, a little bit of coin that, that um, remains in the issuer's account. And by spending that output, it will revoke the certificate. And so anyone that tries to use that certificate in the world, when someone tries to verify it, it comes back with the status of revoked. More questions? Yes, over there. Thank you so much for the presentations and the whole actual two days. have been very, very inspiring. I think we are sold on the idea that trends are changing explained by Brian, I think we are sold on the idea that IT, networked apps, technology could make a difference to higher education. I think we're there, we're in agreement. However, from an HE policy perspective, from a government perspective, from a government who's interested in quality education and no compromise on that, mm -hmm. I think that this, the debate now goes on how do we integrate the use of IT irrespective of the, the tool itself, irrespective of which tool is chosen, but how do we integrate that, those tools into higher education without compromising the quality, which we are so proud of. The quality which is underpinned by the Bologna process, by the European higher education area, which for us is an absolutely no jeopardy. That's it, we have it, no compromise. So I think the debate now goes back into now the practicalities of it. And this is, these are governments which who, and policymakers who will need to debate this, maybe internally, maybe with the help of experts as well. But how do we integrate the, the, all the fantastic IT ideas and technology-based ideas that you have presented into making sure that the quality is still there, whether it's online, whether it's blended, whether it's flipped, whatever, but the quality remains. And that's our, our position. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, that, you know, if I speak from, from the experience of my own university, which, which has 65 online master's degrees, which, you know, 10 years ago we didn't have one, not a single online course, and, and we had no MOOCs and now we have lots of them. We, we had to sit down and think really hard how to do that. Um, I mean, one of the things that, that we decided to do was, was to put everything that we produce through our own same internal quality assurance processes, okay? So there were no special ways of dealing with online courses and MOOCs and traditional campus-based courses, they all have to go through the same internal approval process. And when our external quality assurance agency comes and talks to us about the quality that we offer, and we have institutional review rather than course and subject review, those are on the table as well. 
Um, actually, as it happens, I mean, there are interesting positives as a consequence of moving into digital education. Well, positives in quality terms anyway. And that's that everything you do, almost everything you do, is tangible. In traditional education, you give a lecture, it's not captured, you know, the students have made a few notes of some kinds and gone away. You have nothing to prove what the quality was. You need peer review, which is difficult and, and expensive. If you run seminars or tutorials, you have almost no tangible output. When you run them online, all those discussions, all those pieces of student work, you can roll them out. You can stick them on the table to an external agency and say, that's what our discussions look like. You know, and when I look at the discussions we get in the blogs and wikis in our online courses, actually they're so long I don't have time to read those. You get really good quality work in these settings. And the other is that you know who you get it from all the time. You know, people like me who always sit in the back row and do something different, you can't do that in an online setting because somebody will, you know, will, will, will ask you to do something and there's no escape. So, so actually, you can run at higher quality. What we have found, though, even with the MOOCs, is that design is expensive and takes time. Uh, at least as much time in the early stages as, as traditional courses, and probably more. And teaching at high quality online actually is more expensive in general. And that's why I think the automation and, and intelligent automation is going to be important to us because it's not financially sustainable in the long term and scalable unless we find some ways of economizing on it. But, but the, the quality of teaching, the quality of educational design and then the tangibility of outputs I think enables you much more easily to guarantee quality and to demonstrate quality than we can with our traditional courses, many of which actually to be true, are, are not very exciting and are pretty boring and the quality is very <laughs> variable. When it's out there more in public, you have to think about that. You are exposed. I would just add uh, one more, besides saying yes, what he said, um, I would add that uh, we have two more advantages in the technological realm. One is uh, open and the other is social. So to the extent that we can share this content and make it available, uh, first, that makes it easier for a QA office of a government or a university to assess it, but also that makes it easier for other people to assess it and speed uh, a peer review process. We don't call it that, um, but this is the open source idea. So that, you know, if I take my lectures and put them out there and this guy sees them and finds that they're too long or he finds errors, I can improve it more quickly. And the second is social, uh, that we're able, you know, the social attitude of being online gives us more eyes to keep checking these out. And I think the more the governments persist and, be, and collaborate in that, I think the better the quality assurance will be. Good question. We're running low on time. Um, do we have time for one more question? Please, you have the mic, sir. Thank you. A uh, couple of things. Um, first of all, the, um, uh, the blockchain reminded me about um, DNS. And uh, when, when we spoke about how to verify an institution, I mean, DNS, that's how, what, what it does. There is a whole agreement, and uh, you can verify that um, someone has the, uh, the right to tell you which um, web name has an IP. So that's just a comment that made me think about that. Um, but also, I started thinking about um, identity. Um, okay, so you have the, the, um, the certificate in your mobile, but if I take your mobile, um, is that enough to say that I am you? Um, some, something like that I find it challenging in, in education because we're using so many different tools is identifying students, identifying teachers, especially when we're using so many different type of identities, um, with different facades, different tools, different f mindsets. Um, and do we want to link all these identities? Should we uh, impose a specific identity or should we allow the uh, democratization of um, identification? Thank you. These are the big, the big questions. Um, the first one is much like the others, you know, more about how do we verify institutions. And I, just to get a little more technical, you know, when, when, uh, when a hash of a certificate is created, that straight hash isn't put on the blockchain. It's encrypted with an institution's private key that nobody else has. Um, 
And the only way to unencrypt the hash is with the corresponding public key. That's what opens it up. Um, this is a traditional uh, PGP infrastructure. Um, because that hook exists, um, directories that are more convenient than the ones that already exist today will continue to emerge. Services that, that provide lookups will continue to emerge. So I'm not really worried about that. I think the second part of your question is the bigger one. Um, one has to do with the, the use case of, of, uh, of identity. You know, is there, it's, re it's actually a question more than a statement, is there a universal identity in this scheme? Uh, should we have a universal identity? Uh, and the practicalities of recovery and all the, the uh, practicalities of that. This is a much longer conversation, which will hope, hopefully continue. Um, but to be, to provide some mundane answers very quickly, um, the Block Certs project takes a claims-based approach to identity, so it doesn't um, actually establish a universal identity. It trusts that the institutions have a pre-existing relationship. They, they have a, a school email. They know who they are. Um, and so a lot of that social dimension is being used to establish a connection. Um, and then, you know, each certificate uh, that a student holds could you know, they could share public keys or they could have different ones. So it's actually up to the learner to decide how, how obscure they want to be. So it's very, it would be very hard for anyone to put together a comprehensive story on an individual. It's up for them to reveal and conceal themselves as they see fit. And so, you know, if you think of identity as a series of attributes, um, that, that, but now these attributes are in, are in control of the learner uh, and, and Intimacy with someone has to do with the synthesis of these attributes, which happen across a technical layer. Um, these things could be linked to identity platforms that exist, whether they're cryptographic ones like Blockstack uh, or traditional ones. Um, but the, um, that's more of an open question and one that's probably more properly solved separately. You know, we were really focused on making the claims-based approach ironclad. Um, now, if you lose your if you lose your phone, you know how, there's multiple ways to recover. You know, um, first of all, you know they're sent an email notification with a link to get it. You have your your histories of your emails. You, um, you they're encouraged to back back up their certificates on Dropbox or whatever. But one of the qualities of these uh, mobile apps is the they're or sometimes they're called wallets to hold these things is they're hierarchical, they use a hierarchical deterministic key structure so that with a passphrase, you could actually re, if, if you lost your backups, lost your phone, lost all your emails, lo, you know, lost everything, you could actually regenerate all the certificates that belong to you using this passphrase that only you know. Um, but as you're touching on, it does provide a greater burden of responsibility on the student.